Um, now, Mr. Michael Bishop, my replacement in the water, the one that I, <laughs> that I told Dave, there's this kid from Hopewell. And his name is Michael Bishop. Boobs, good God. <laughs> My name is Michael Bishop. Yes. Ah, April Fools! <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, I'm the original Beef King of Mighty. I played in war with Dave starting the summer before my senior year in high school, back in 1987 to around 1994. And, you know, we eventually went in different directions. I always counted Dave Brocky among my dearest friends, and I loved him very much. And I, too, never thought that I would be standing here doing this. Because he was just a life force. I mean, Chris, you know, I almost don't even need to stand up here. He, that was so awesome, it, capturing what Dave was. And Dave, to me, was possibility, man. Like, this whole town, Richmond, <laughs> looking at this place from Hopewell, Virginia. Like, you know, I talked with Dave a lot <laughs> about death because he was the sort of guy who would talk about death. Like, you could talk about things like that with him. And we talked about mortality, about belief, about the future. But ever since I came to know him, I, you know, I, I've been unable to imagine a world without Dave Brocky. And the good thing is that I don't have to. He was central to my knowledge and experience of the world, as he has been to so many people here today. And none of us, we don't have to imagine a world without him because we had him. We had him. And for that, oh my God, what a gift that is. We had him. And the world will never be without him again. Ever. None of us will. Um, and that's what matters. Uh, in those early days on the Guar school bus, man, you know, I want to talk to that. I want to speak to that, to, to my, my friends, man, puttering through the Mojave Desert, <laughs> fighting over crackers at a, at a maximum speed of 45 miles per hour, <laughs> passing the corpses of cows. And Dave and, and Chuck Barg, I remember distinctly him coming when we drove from Louisiana and we got to Texas. No, I have been to fucking Texas. And we can, he's like, there's cowboys out there. <laughs> they were real cowboys on a horse and everything. You know, we were all such fucking bumpkins and geeks. Geeks, man. That's what we did. We played Dungeons and Dragons. Dave Brocky. So many times I've thought to myself, my God, what, what kid wouldn't give his left nut to have Dave Brocky as a dungeon master? And we, and we talked about putting it in the obituary under the things he was. Dave Brocky, comma, dungeon master. So there we are, we're like hurling through the night, you know, and to drive the bus, you were Captain Kirk. That's what geeks we were. And it became a verb, kirking. Driving was kirking. <laughs> and every Kirk needed a Sulu. Someone to navigate or to talk to just to keep them awake. And, uh, you know, Suluing, it was all a verb. So uh, I was oftentimes Brocky's Sulu. And I didn't even drop, I mean, I didn't have a driver's license, was fucking... But we were just such unbelievable nerds, man. I mean, that, and Brocky, what I remember about...
about that night, you know, and it's crazy because everybody who was on that bus, so many of them, they're here right now, almost everybody, they're here right now on that bus that night that we're hurtling through and, and sweating and stinking. And I can still hear Brocky in the darkness looking out at the highway coming straight for us singing Springsteen, Nebraska. <laughs> The whole fucking album. The whole thing. In that a cappella, booming, utterly unself conscious baritone. <laughs> Through the badlands of Wyoming. Yeah, and we're trying to sleep. You know, we're crying because we lost it, but we goddamn got it. We got it. We got that. It's got to crawl. We got that, buddy. God. Fuck, we got it. Um, and, you know, those moments, those questions, like, you know, we talked about everything, but what we did on the bus, what I remember about the bus is dreaming and scheming about what we were going to do. And... The people who are here today, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. I've tried to explain this again and again. I've never been able to explain it to anybody. That, you know, that sense of possibility that anything was possible. And after a show, we're hurtling through the night, and all we needed to do was think of it. I've seen in articles Dave tries to describe this. I've, I've read him struggling with it. Spitballing, he called it. Holding up a mirror. Uh, a fun house mirror to the world. And I guess that's right, you know, just throwing out the ideas. And the craziest thing of all was that they came true because of the people here in this room. They came true. He, you know, yes, let's have a giant ass <laughs> that shoots out oatmeal turds. <laughs> Do it. It's a green light. Shit up. And I'm an academic now. I have to try to explain to people this shit. I can't do that. I gave up. One look. I live in fear of the day that they just read one fucking the lyrics to one song. I'm fine. So you know. But man, he he showed me through example that whatever I wanted to be, it was in my power to realize it. That's what, that's what Dave showed. And he was our leader. There is no question about that. He was our leader. And he was a very good one. Uh, he did it uh, under duress, the good times and the bad. He was a motor, you know, it sounds so trite to say it, but it's just true, true, true what he's saying, that what Chris was saying, he was a motivator of men. And he, he saved me. You know, that's what I'm trying to say is that uh, he taught me that I was, it's not that, that I had this chance, it's he, that I was obligated to realize my potential. That, that it was my, my duty, that it was expected of me. And he, you know, man, that's the kind of thing you say about a fucking drill sergeant at like a, at a military school, you know? Well, he did that. He made a man out of me. But you know, he fucking did. And he did it fun. You don't notice when you're being made a man of by a clown like that. You don't notice it. So, you know, to me, I remember distinctly him saying, like, you know, so did you graduate? This, this summer, your, your ass is mine. And, you know, Rocky, he was a big deal to me. I mean, coming from, from where I came from, this fat, tearful, little, aspiring punk rocker and bass player and hope well, all I had was hope, just desire. And I needed direction. And, and you know, Dave's band, that's the other thing I want people to understand that, you know, I mean, things were different, information was different. 
And Death Piggy, to me, <clears throat> I recognized it the moment I saw it. I saw something that I could relate to, something that I could have, that I could do. I saw a way out. In my particular punk rock conversion narrative, Death Piggy and Dave Brocky himself, they were huge. I mean, those names, it, I, it's not like I made, a, I made any distinction between Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Dead Kennedys, Death Piggy. You know, it was all the same to me. I mean, and, and the sound of that music, it sounded like anything was permissible, like rules were suspended. And, you know, I want to talk about music just for a minute because, and Dave's contribution, right? His mastery of the absurd. Even then, he, in, in Death Piggy, he was building a sort of world, and it sounded like a world that I wanted to live in. Bathtubs in space. Boners. Whipping around the bed. You know, and hope, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it all just seemed like, you know, beyond me from this mysterious world outside of my life, and when I got a chance to join it, I'll never forget it. How I stood with Dave right over here, right down here, man, at that point where the, there's a place in the triangle uh, right by the dairy where there's like this weird triangle street. And I just remember this feeling washing over me that my life was never going to be the same again. And the guy who was next to me was Dave Rocky, you know? Um, and uh, uh, here's a terrifying fact, you know? I learned to be a person from Dave Brockie, from being in war. And from all of these guys. These are my brothers, my sisters. And, and Dave could be a parent. He was a guardian of sorts. He protected me. He protected me from things people were doing. Uh, he protected me from Fat Lawrence, who used to run the, uh, the Marvins. Remember that dude? Me. And he was like, he is 17 years old. <laughs> so, and, you know, I mean, but this, this, a man of contradictions, you know, the truth Chris was saying, like, it's just, uh, you just had to give up trying to understand him and just take him, uh, take the world as he did, as one long, absurd, crazy, terrifying, <laughs> hilarious joke. And, and, you know, this is a guy who's saying, no more homo butt chain. <laughs> or you'll get AIDS. <laughs> who created AIDS beer. He made sure that inappropriate, offensive references permeated every single thing that Guar created. Thus, creating a, just, you know, a, I mean, a, a masterpiece of obscenity. And, and yet Dave loved his brother Andrew fiercely. And I remember that. I remember seeing, I almost didn't understand it. You know, he, he would become like a kid around Andrew and the tenderness with which he spoke of this guy. Uh, how clearly Dave loved him. And when Andrew succumbed to AIDS, it hurt him. And he was creating about that. That's what he was doing. You know, he got a bunch of, just, you know, a room full of, of, of metal head kids to sing with him. I'm gay and I'm proud. No, he did that, man. He did that. You know, in a time when people were ignoring that disease, characterizing it as a gay thing, Dave Brocky was talking about it. Gore was talking about it. And we did it our way, in a way that might have uh, ruffled some feathers, but we did it. And, you know, uh, so, you know, I, I'm just, I'm so proud, man, all the time of, of that. I'm proud of, of, of all of it. Um, What's that? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I said, and I will say here again, that Dave Rocky, the musician, the lyricist, the lead singer, he is seriously underrated. And I will go so far as to say that I have, 
I have never seen a more vibrant, energetic, and quick-witted performer on stage. Vaudeville, bringing in... Groucho Marx to heavy metal. That intellect, man, and lyrically, true poetry. True poetry, you know, and he hated fucking poetry. Hated it! But he wrote it, man, and he wrote it you know, I mean, now, like, years later, you know, I mean, people are, you know, there's a whole, like, movement of, like, you know, well, maybe poetry shouldn't be, like, fucking navel-gazing bullshit. And, you know, he was doing that. And, you know, uh, his voice, you know, he was a first-rate poet. And like I said, a past master of obscenity. Uh, and he used that to create meaning. He wrote so clearly and sang so passionately. His voice, just so utterly unique. Uh, he brought to heavy metal music true poetry, true depth of feeling, and a broad knowledge, a very far-ranging intellect about history, about art. I, I can say, and this is, it's, uh, he was a genius. He really was. He was a genius. of his voice, which is just, I mean, I can't replicate it, like, you know, but when we went to the Grammys the first time, I remember that we saw him yeah, the first time. <laughs> so many, I don't even remember my year. But... We saw Patrick Stewart in the Shriners Auditorium. We were in costume, Patrick Stewart. Uh, it was up on a balcony like this looking out over, and you know, I mean, it's L.A., right? You know, you see famous, famous people, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's my daughter. No, she's always here. It's cool. <laughs> Rocky. John Luke Picard! As I live and breathe! And, and what he said, you know, what, what John, what Patrick, what this guy said, like, he laughed. And he goes, someone should do Shakespeare. <laughs> That's quite a baritone. And then Bracky starts fending through the crowd. You know, he's trying to get to him. Patrick Stewart's like, oh. <laughs> absolutely no way he's going to talk to that big rubber monster. <laughs> just a minute in conclusion about and, and Chris man I mean it, it, Dave's generosity of spirit he made things possible for other artists in this city he didn't have to do that he didn't have to let bands rehearse for cheap he didn't have to reach out to other artists to acknowledge them like he did he gave so many people a sense that what they were doing was worth a shit man I mean a lot of people you know, I've looked at the Facebook, you know, Matt Connor from RPG, Dave Brocky, first person who paid me for something, you know? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, jeez. But, you know, if, 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 you were, <laughs> if you were trying to create, if you were trying to do something, he'd help you out. Chris has said that, and I agree. But without hesitation, I mean, he didn't even think about it. Just wasn't even an issue. So, Dave Rocky, you miserable fuck. I love you. Uh, and you know, finally, I want to say <laughs> just something about. You know, Chris said the other day that other than his own dick, the dick that he's seen more than any other dick is Dave Rocky's dick. away from seeing Dave's dick. <laughs> so, oh, dick, yeah. But, you know, uh, I, I just want to, <laughs> I want to say something. Dave Rocky loved the people he played music with. He loved the people in war. He loved y'all. He was, he loved me. 
He loved all of us. And, that, you know, Adam said that, and he's absolutely right. And it's a, you know, it might sound, it doesn't sound strange to anybody who knew him. That he, he loved and was loyal, loyal to all of us. And, you know, and just before I go, man, on grief, I want my friends to know that I love so much. Let it out. Cry a river of tears. There's not enough tears. Keep crying. And reach out. Don't let grief get you alone. Okay? I love you all. We're going to uh, see uh, a video montage of Dave Brockies. <laughs> 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 <laughs>